I, I think war is kind of, I mean, obviously it's interesting, but I think in some ways it's so overwhelming to, to try to understand all the intricacies and all the different wars, all the different individual battles in some cases that change the nature of war and change the direction of war and all these things. And I think it's daunting to get into sometimes. I think that's why I've been hesitant to really, not not hesitant per se, I'm just always like more interested in learning other things than I am going towards war. But I still also know that I should know all this. And, and then you start to understand this and it's like a rabbit hole. It just goes deeper and deeper and deeper and one battle and one war ties into another and then you need to know the other ones. So you can know this one. So it's hard for people to really understand how... I don't know how to get into how complicated this stuff is. And I mean, the movie is a good, it's a good time to, it's a good movie to, to, to get that in your head a little bit and to start thinking more about the role war has played in human history, not just American history, not just even the history of the countries that have been at war, but it's something of world history because war often determines, you know, on the larger scale, which countries are going to be, influencing the direction of the world so i mean you know it's not it's not a conversation people like to have we would i think we would all like to imagine that we're in a place or very close to a place where might doesn't make right and where war is not the way that um things have to be defended but i don't think we're there yet i don't think we're there yet I don't uh, think we're there yet. Yeah, I think I think that you hit upon something important, which is that I don't. Okay, so I don't think we've actually come to terms with the recent wars in America, and certainly, and, and this sounds weird, but I think I think that the domestic turmoil and the cultural changes that were happening during the '60s and early '70s are linked to the war in Vietnam. And that those things resonate throughout the culture even today. Because it is people that are the, the boomer generation, that the baby boomer generation, that were either in Vietnam fighting or trying, to, trying not to fight in Vietnam or protesting Vietnam. So, you know, these, these, these people, this is still, that, that's why I think, look, I, I like history, so I'll, I'll study World War I or I'll, stu I'll study... Uh, you know, the Mongol conquest or whatever, just because it's interesting to me. But for people who may be wanting to tune out and say, ah, what's Vietnam have to do with me? Understand that the people that, that were there, the people that dealt with it are still alive. Yeah. So, you know, the, e even major figures at the top are, are still, many of them are still alive. Um, so this one isn't over in the sense that everyone is gone, you know, and, and the things that it did, to this country i still think are we're living with yeah i do i mean that's even 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 when everyone does die off and it's that old um like world war ii for example i think no it was which one was it it was world war one or two which is the one that woodrow wilson decided what's saying this was the one that they created the the united nation was it the united nations Club? yeah okay so world war one is world woodrow it's hard to say woodrow, woodrow wilson, wilson. Yeah. interesting fact about this ho chi Minh wrote a letter to Wo woodrow wilson because woodrow wilson was promising democracy across the world in, in the wake of this anti-colonialist idea uh which america played a part in america in some ways was caught between two worlds because as part of our kind of national ideology, we say, well, we believe in freedom. We believe in independence. So we're kind of anti-colonial in that sense. Now, I know a lot of people will say that's not real, yeah. but, but let's, let's at least say that the rhetoric and some of the genuine belief by some leaders is, is that. And so that puts us in opposition to France and, and uh, the UK to some degree, who were colonial powers. Now, after World War One, and especially after World War Two, uh, as we see in this, the French are leaving Vietnam. The the, the colonies are collapsing. Uh, so, oddly, America steps in to in a lot of places to fill that vacuum. 
That's why we're there. The French leave in, in, in the mid 50s. Now, now, strangely, you know, our involvement in Vietnam goes back even that far in the 50s and, and the late 40s because we were actually funding the French war effort to keep Vietnam French to some degree. Anyway, it went off track a little bit. It, you're right. It is a, you know, history can be a rabbit hole where I can just keep on going back and back and back. And I mean, because that's the thing. Back. They're all connected. It is and all connected. The, the reason I brought that up, because I think it was, uh, I mean, that war, the First World War, kind of set the precedent for the idea that um, we need to, I, I believe the exact quote is, make the world safe for democracy. That was Woodrow Wilson's quote. And that was kind of how he uh, justified, no, I can't remember. I think it's the Second World War. Well, well, so you're right about the idea that Woodrow Wilson wanted to uh, bring democracy that was his whole rhetoric. Now, it wasn't the United Nations he found. It was, called, it was the precursor of that called the League of Nations, That's which then it. ends up faltering before World War II. And then after World War II, we get the United Nations. But you're right mm -hmm. in the idea that Woodrow Wilson wanted espoused the idea of democracy around the world. And the link to this is that Ho Chi Minh had actually tried to contact him and said, look, I'm, a, I'm one of the leaders of... Uh, my people, the nation of Vietnam, and we want the, we want control of our country. We don't want the French to be a mm. part of our country. But, you know, Woodrow Wilson, as far as I know, either didn't essentially ignored that, you know. Mm. And so that this promise of this, this, this kind of American rhetoric and this promise of freedom and independence all around the world in opposition to Western colonialism didn't work out for everybody <laughs> it yeah. did you know and and, it, and and now people can say well uh that was the plan all along you know uh or people can what i really think is that there's always a lag between the rhetoric a country you know puts out there and what actually happens and and, and that theme in and of itself is a theme of vietnam because you get people, especially early in the war, who Americans are talking about, who go there voluntarily, who aren't drafted, uh, or who accept the, the notion of the draft to, to Vietnam and, and aren't uh, upset about it. Um, you know, people who still believe. So in the early years of the Vietnam War, in the mid-60s, let's say, there was this still, this was coming out of the Kennedy era and all this, this idealism of, yeah, we're going to go to Vietnam, we're going to, you know, number one, we're going to go to Vietnam, we're going to win, right? Because Americans feel like they always win at this point in time, even though Korea was a little bit, um, a little bit odd but in terms of like an exact victory. But, mm. you know, there's this idealism there. And um, by the early 70s, let's say 71, 72, 20% apparently of... Uh, people in the military had tried heroin at least once while in Vietnam. There was fragging, which I don't know if you know what fragging is, but this is where lower level, like say your basic infantry soldier, right, is being told by his higher up to go out on patrol. And at this point in the war, the armies, the United States, people don't understand how far this went. The, the United States Army almost collapsed on itself. So, oh. so everyone is so by 71, 72 people were fragging is when you take a grenade and you walk into your, your officer's quarters in the middle of the night and you throw the fucking grenade and let and kill your own guy. Cause Whoa. you don't. Yeah. So that's fragging. <laughs> Uh, it, it could, it's fragging because of fragmentation grenade, but also it could be you just shoot the person, what, whatever it is. So the idea is like... as mutiny, though, is essentially the, Yeah, it is. well, it's right, beyond it's that. Your own. It's, yeah, it's your own... Pe you, so let's say you have a commanding officer who's like, you're going to go out on patrol again. It's 1972. You know the war is lost. You know this is bullshit. You got drafted. You didn't want to go. You were forced to go. You're bitter. Maybe you're, maybe you're doing... Uh, maybe whatever it is and and people would decide well no we're I'm not going out there to do this again and some people would kill their commanding officer in order to not do it That's i mean that crazy. that is 
Christy. That breakdown of authority. See, people don't understand this, and that's why it's kind of important to understand. But again, one thing leads to another. So, so the Gulf War, the first Gulf War in the 90s, you know, there was this fear. It took it took a generation to rebuild the this is not this is the opinion of others. I'm no expert once again, but it took a generation to rebuild the United States Army to some degree from the war in Vietnam. For wow. the, the, the the amount of degradation that occurred on so many different levels is something a lot of people don't, aren't aware of or understand. So. Yeah, I don't understand that, and I'm not aware of it either. I mean, the, I feel like the Vietnam War, what I do know is that it was a very, it was kind of the, uh, in a way, this turning point in the way wars are fought and the way war was done, and even the, the kind of uh, relationship the American people had to war. 